Rio de Janeiro, November 12th, 1823. It's the early hours of the morning, and Brazil's Constitutional Assembly is in crisis. Originally formed to choose which Portuguese laws apply in Brazil, the Assembly has decided that, instead, they will draft a Brazilian constitution. The more liberal Brazilian party controls the body. They want a constitution that restrains the power of the monarchy, where the rival Portuguese party, who wants greater royal power, is vastly outnumbered. But Emperor Pedro has decided to have his say. Refusing to be a figurehead, he surrounded the building with troops and demanded the assembly dissolve. They comply, at the point of a bayonet, in what will come to be called the Night of Agony. Oh, don't get it twisted, Pedro wants a constitution, but he himself will write it. Thanks so much to CuriosityStream for helping to tell today's historical tale. When Pedro declared Brazil independent in 1822, he was still years away from actually taking control of the country. Covering vast territory and difficult to govern from the center, it was 1824 before Pedro had forced the last Portuguese troops out and re-established control of the provinces. Though in reality, he'd be fighting for control his whole reign. Portugal would not officially recognize Brazil's independence until 1825, and only then due to British mediation and a humiliating list of caveats. Not only did Britain get special trading rights for brokering the deal, but Brazil had to reimburse Portugal for property left behind by the Portuguese who had fled, and John VI got to pretend that he granted Brazilian independence. The British also stipulated that Brazil promised to work toward ending the slave trade. In the meantime, Pedro also inherited two ongoing political crises. The first was a war in Brazil's southernmost province, only annexed in 1821, which was trying to break away with the help of a neighboring country we know today as Argentina. And the second was the always restive Northeast, which rose up in reaction to the Night of Agony, briefly declaring itself the Confederation of the Equator before Pedro smashed the uprising and executed its leaders. Oh, and who ran Brazil when Pedro was at war, you ask? That would be Leopoldina. Yet the most dangerous challenge was the increasing factionalism between the Brazilian and Portuguese parties. While the rural landowners of the Brazilian party had been pro-independence and helped vault Pedro into his position, he quickly found that they wanted him to be largely powerless. He therefore switched sides, falling in with the more recently arrived urban class of the Portuguese party who ran the economy in the cities. Though the irony was that both of these were, in the terms of the time, liberal parties. Both believed in constitutional government, though they differed in details. In fact, they differed so much that at one point political mobs flooded the streets of Rio in a multi-hour-long bottle-throwing war. But when Pedro and his ministers drafted the constitution in 1824, it was the Portuguese party that he mostly kept in charge. And the resulting document was extremely liberal for its time, with more rights than many European constitutions of the period. The government would have the three standard branches of the U.S. version, executive, legislative, and judicial, plus a fourth for the king to moderate the other three. The resulting system has been called a presidential monarchy, where the emperor, as head of the executive branch, could also appoint cabinets, judges, and legislators at the General Assembly. Also, voting for the representative assembly was restricted to property-owning men. But the value of property was low enough that a full 15% of the population could vote. Now, I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but given that the United States led the Americas at 18% and the European states averaged about 5-6% to at the time, it was pretty good. However, it also enshrined slavery in law and barred enslaved people from citizenship. Pedro, though himself a slave owner, had come to favor abolition. Yet, like almost all Brazilian abolitionists, he wanted to see it phased out gradually because he feared general emancipation would turn into a violent Haitian-style revolution. But in practical terms, he was really just kicking the issue down the road. And while Pedro largely respected this constitution, the Night of Agony solidified him in the Brazilian party's mind as an enemy of constitutionalism. And then came the family problems. Because in the midst of this political rancor, Pedro's private life was burning down in public and taking parts of Europe with it. Remember when Pedro went to Sao Paulo and declared independence? Well, while there, he also met a woman named Domicila de Castro, who became his mistress. Now previously, the serially unfaithful Pedro had hid his affairs. But with Domicila, he gave her a house, made her a baroness, legitimized their children, and just generally flaunted the relationship. And when Leopoldina objected, he got cruel. Deciding to rub it in her face, he made Domicila her lady-in-waiting, and insisted the two appear together in public. He also isolated Leopoldina in the palace, where she lived friendless and humiliated. 
which in historical terminology, and I want to make sure I get this phrase right, hold on a second. Ah, yes, here it is, was a huge jerk move, especially considering all Leopoldina had done to secure independence and make Pedro emperor. But the problems were not just marital strife. Family drama also flared up across the Atlantic. In March of 1826, King John of Portugal suddenly died. And true to his indecisive nature, he'd mentioned that he wanted Pedro to succeed him, but he never made it official. Suddenly, Pedro started insisting he was King of Portugal as well as Emperor of Brazil. But his mother, Carlota Joaquina, wanted Pedro's brother Miguel to become king instead. Problem was, Miguel was living in exile in Vienna as a result of joining one of Carlota's failed rebellions against his father. Pedro became the absentee king of Portugal. But his claim was on shaky ground, since by law, foreigners couldn't inherit the throne. And his declaration of independence made him technically Brazilian and not Portuguese. Interests in Brazil were also unhappy with the arrangement, thinking he might abandon them for Lisbon like his father did. Realizing that he had to choose between his kingdoms, Pedro figured out a way to keep the crown in the family. A little too much in the family, actually. He abdicated the Portuguese throne in favor of his seven-year-old daughter Maria, promising his brother Miguel that in a few years he could return from exile, marry Maria, and they could rule together as uncle, niece, husband, and wife. But in the meantime, he could basically run Portugal from Rio. So yeah. And that, right then, was when Leopoldina sprung her revenge. See, she had a lot of time while being isolated in the palace, and she'd spent it writing letters to her family about everything Pedro had done to her. Letters that wound up in some pretty powerful hands, given that her sister had been married to Napoleon and her father was the Emperor of Austria. But then, in a tragic twist, in December of 1826, Leopoldina died from complications following a miscarriage. Pedro, fighting in the south with Domicila in tow, wasn't even there to visit her deathbed. And this proved the turning point where Pedro's family problems started becoming political problems. Because Leopoldina was more popular than he was, and her lavish state funeral turned into an anti-Pedro hate fest. In Rio, people started throwing rocks at Domicila's house, and Pedro began feeling so guilty about his actions that he sent her away. Now, Pedro's public appearances were drowned out by chants of CONSTITUTION and ABDICATE a situation that only worsened when Pedro lost the war in the south, with the rebel province gaining independence as the nation of Uruguay. Things were even worse in Lisbon. When Miguel returned from exile in 1828, he kicked his Nissan say out, declared himself an absolute monarch, and teamed up with his mother in a reign of terror, which left Pedro trying to rally liberal support for Maria's restoration, while the absolutists and most of Pedro's sisters backed Miguel. In Brazil, his throne felt at risk. In Portugal, he was at war with his family, and he couldn't even get remarried because Leopoldina's letters had wrecked his reputation in Europe, and no other princesses would have him. It took him three years to find a bride. By 1831, he decided he was done with Brazil, its factions, and its politics. All he wanted was to get to Portugal and secure his daughter's throne. So he did the logical thing. Name his five-year-old son Pedro temporary regent, and head on back to Portugal with an army to depose his brother. There, he fought and dug trenches alongside his men. A soldier's soldier, he regained in war some of the respect he'd lost among the European nobility. And once he won the war and restored Maria, it felt like a new beginning. But then he started to sicken. Pedro I, Emperor of Brazil, died of tuberculosis an ocean away from the country he'd helped found and left a five-year-old child on its throne, which I'm sure will go great, but we'll find out for sure next time. But you know what has gone great? Us joining a ton of creators that we love over on Nebula, our Buy Creators for Creators streaming service that we've mentioned to you in the past. And you know what's new and that I'm very excited for that's on Nebula right now? Season 2 of Working Titles, where a bunch of us creators discuss the openings to our favorite video games. And I just gotta say, I am super proud that my episode just dropped on why I think the original Bioshock may have the greatest video game opening of all time, complete with insights from David Flamboris, the artist who created its iconic lighthouse. And I'm not alone. There's been phenomenal breakdowns of other games openings from folks like People Make Games, who did a deep dive into Geralt's first cutscene in The Witcher, Nando V Movies talking Saint Row 4 wackiness, and the one that might eclipse us all, pun very much intended, Low Spec Gamer's discussion of Majora's Mask. Dang you, Skull Kid! This, of course, is on top of thousands of shows from EC and our other favorite educational entertainers on the internet, all presented ad-free. 
And because CuriosityStream, the online learning platform where you can watch tons of amazing documentaries and award-winning original series, loves us independent educational creators, they've teamed up with us over at Nebula, so we can offer you a dang fine two-for-one deal. Sign up for CuriosityStream using our link in the description below, and you'll get a matching Nebula subscription absolutely free. Ooh, and if you've been enjoying our Empire of Brazil series, as a companion piece, you gotta check out Curiosity Stream's documentary, Rio the Great Saga, which I was really into because it explores the history specific to Rio de Janeiro before, during, and after the events our series covers. Not to mention I'm a sucker for glorious drone shots, so there's always that. So, would you kindly head over to curiositystream.com slash extra credits right now? That way, you'll get both of these phenomenal streaming services for only $14.97 for an entire year, which for those of you keeping track at home is 26% off the regular price. And when you do, not only will you get to watch some of the best content on the internet and under the sea, but you'll also be helping out our channel in the process. Thanks so much. A legendary thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blaine, Kyle Murgatroyd, Kyle Wildridge, and O'Reels One. 